Good morning, Year 7s. Welcome to Year 7 Chemistry. A few helpful tips for working at home. Try to work in a quiet area with little distractions. Read all slides and questions carefully. Remember, help is here if you get stuck. Teachers will be available between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. to answer any question that you might have. And the homework will need to be completed and posted by the deadline. Now, this is your remember task. Now, as you can see, the driving question is what are solutions? Now, today's lesson was done on Tuesday, the 5th of May, 2020. So don't pay the date too much attention. Now, you're due now. So we have two different questions. One is for foundation students. And for those who think that they can manage, we'll move on to question two. Question one, what is the difference between a mixture and a compound. Have a go at that. If you're finished and you think you are up for a challenge, go on to question number two. Question two asks, how would you separate a mixture of iron filing, iron is a metal, and sulfur, which is a powder? Just think about it. How would you separate a mixture of metal and powder? Now pause the video and give yourselves five minutes to complete a task. Welcome back. Now we're going to look at the questions. Now question one, foundations. Now if you have only done this question, no problem, good job. But let's see how well you have done on this one question. Now, what is the difference between a mixture and a compound? Now, there are different answers you can give to this one question. Let's have a look. Now, for compounds, we have compounds versus mixtures. One, the composition of elements present in a compound is fixed. Let's read that again. The composition of elements present present in a compound is fixed remember that compounds is a mixture of two or more elements that are chemically bonded together so they are in a fixed pattern or structure mixture the composition of the elements present in a mixture is not fixed Remember that two or more substances that are not chemically bonded to each other. Bear that in mind. Number two, the properties of a compound are different to those of its elements. Remember in our last lesson when we looked at using sodium chloride, which is salt, versus using sodium and chlorine by, them, by themselves. Right? Once two elements have combined together, they lose some of their original and individual properties. For mixture, it shows the properties of all its constituent elements. So if you were able to separate, <coughs> sorry, if you were able to separate the elements into their different groups, the different particles or elements will have their original properties. Three, its constituents can be separated by chemical method only. Now remember, in a compound, the substances or elements that are used in a compound are chemically bonded to each other. And sometimes these reactions are very tedious in terms of to reverse. So some reactions, you can reverse them, and some, you can break the bonds between the elements, but it is only separated by chemical methods only. For mixtures, 
its constituents can be separated by physical method, such as filtration, distillation, chromatography, and crystallization. Number four. Now, these are two new words that I want you guys to highlight. For compounds, a compound is always homogeneous in nature. For mixtures, the mixture is homogeneous or heterogeneous in nature. Now, I will not be explaining this just yet because we will be looking at this in the lesson. Now, if you are ever asked this question again, what is the difference between a mixture and a compound? It will be lovely if you could remember everything, but if not, you can use any two of these mixtures or combine any two of these answers to give you your answer for question one. Now for the higher tiers. Now if you felt a bit more adventurous, let's have a go. Now this is a simple no-brainer. How would you separate a mixture of iron filings and sulfur? You have metal, little bits of metals dispersed in powder. Think about it. How would you separate metal from a powder? I've seen you guys in my lessons quite a number of times using magnets. How will you use the magnets to separate the, the metals from the powder? Look at this image. What you simply need to do is to put a magnet over the powder and the magnet will attract all the metal bits out of it, right? So that wasn't too hard, was it? All right, just remember, it is a mixture of iron filings and sulfur, which is a powder. The iron filings were not bonded to the sulfur powder, which makes it a mixture, which means that you can separate it. So again, for this one, you just need a bar magnet and you're good to go. Awesome. Now, there are a few key terms that I want you guys to remember between now and the end of the lesson. So if you have the need to pause the video and try to remember these words and write them down, because trust me, in your quiz, they will be coming back. So these are a few words that I want you to remember. Dissolving, mixing of solid with a liquid to make a solution. Mixture, two or more substances that are mixed together but not chemically bonded are joined saturated a solution containing the maximum amount of solute that it can hold soluble a substance that can dissolve in a solvent solubility a measure of how much solute can dissolve in a solvent at a given temperature Solute, solid that dissolves in a solvent to make a solution. Solution, mixture made when a solute dissolves in a solvent. And finally, solvent, liquid in which a solid dissolves to make solution. Now, please take a moment to copy these definitions off so we can go back to the previous slide which looks at dissolving mixture saturated and soluble and back to this one which looks at solubility solute solution and solvent now when a solid dissolves in a liquid it forms a special type of mixture called solution <clears throat> Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to click on the box below and a few words will be coming up. Now we have the solvent. Now the solvent is the liquid or substance that does the dissolving. Now what I want you to always bear in mind that a solvent is not always water. All right. Now when you think about dissolving things, 
the first thing that comes to mind is water because water is considered a universal solvent that's right water is a universal <clears throat> universal solvent now let's move on now we add a solute now a solute the substance being dissolved a solution can have more than one solute but only one solvent so remember the solvent is the liquid base of this mixture the solvent is what the solute dissolves into and remember that the universal solvent that we normally use in science is water now the solute is anything that is dissolved in the solvent one common solute that we can use is salt salt would be the solute and water would be the solvent so once we put the salt in the water we start around we get a solution of salt water now the same thing could be said about sugar if we had sugar to our solvent the sugar would be the solute and the solvent would be the water the solution will be sugar and water or a sugar solution now solute and solvent solution is formed when the solvent and solute mix together. Again, solution is formed when the solvent and solute mix together. So remember, in order to get a solution, we need a solute to be dissolved in a solvent. For example, the solute would be salt and the solvent water. The solution would be salt water. For sugar, the sugar would be the solute, and the solvent that we would use is water. The solution would be a sugar solution. Please bear those in mind. So we use three different S words to describe solution, solute, and solvent. So if you need a minute or two to go over, please go back in the video. Now, two words that I told you before that we will be looking at. Now, mixtures can be divided into two groups, homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. Now, as you can see, there are differences between the two what difference can you recognize by just looking at the pictures now as you can see by just looking at this mixture you can see that the particles are in a particular arrangement right the particles are evenly distributed all right and remember the word homo what does the word homo means it means the same so the dispersion of the particles within the structure is the same heterogeneous mixture remember ether hetero ether opposite all right now as you can see not not much mixing is taking place here so you have particles that are squished to one side here and the other squished to this side now one example of this would be salt and water one dissolves into the other until the solute becomes evenly distributed throughout the mixture however the heterogeneous mixture is like oil and water they do not mix so you can easily see where they are separated now a homogeneous mixture is the same uniform appearance and composition throughout many homogeneous mixtures are commonly referred to as a solution now going back to the picture now, as you can see, all the particles are evenly distributed and spaced out in the solution. So again, homogeneous mixture 
has the same uniform appearance. Same uniform appearance and composition throughout. Many homogeneous mixtures are commonly referred to as solutions. So remember the sugar and water is sugar solution. Now looking at the other one, heterogeneous mixtures consist of visible different substances or phases. Now the oil and water, remember if you're trying to mix oil and water, the oil will always go to the top and the water goes to the bottom. It looks at density, which is not something that we'll be going into in today's lesson. So the density will determine which floats, which one sinks. Now you can definitely see the different phases in this type of mixture. They do not combine with each other. Now, look at this picture. We have pure substances and we have mixtures. Now, remember, pure substances, we have elements and compounds. We know that in elements, elements contains only one type of atom. Now, all the atoms, if you pick 10 different atoms from an element, all the atoms of that element, they will have similar characteristics and properties. However, if you select, let's say, five purple, and five green from the compound. The compound is actually made up of two or more substances or elements bonded together. Now, all the purple atoms will have properties similar to each other and characteristics, and the same can be said for the green. They would have the same properties and the same characteristics. Now, mixtures. We have homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. Now, as you can see in the homo, they are evenly distributed, all right? For heterogeneous, you can see where we can literally see where they are bundled together. All the particles or atoms are packed in one central location. So you can visibly see them. But for homogeneous, you cannot visibly see them because they're evenly distributed. All right. So remember, examples of homogeneous would be like sugar solution or salt solution. And heterogeneous would be like oil and water. You can see the different phases or layers. All right. So if you think you need a minute or two to go over this, please pause the video and go back and start over. Now, a spoonful of coffee powder is added to a beaker of water. Now, this is an experiment that we did in lesson. Now, if we have the mass of 100 grams of water and we add a mass of 5 grams of what? Coffee powder to the solution or to the liquid or solvent, we should end up off, we should end up with a mass of 105 grams. Now, <clears throat> which is the solvent, which is the solute, which is the solution? Remember, the solvent is normally the liquid that the solute is dissolved in. Now, the solvent would be the beaker containing water. And the solute that we dissolve in the, in the solvent is the coffee. And the solution would be a coffee solution, your nice warm cup of coffee. Okay? Awesome. Now, why is the mass of the coffee solution different to the mass of the water? Can you pause the video? and have a think about this. Why is the mass of the coffee solution is different to the mass of water? All right, let's go. Remember in our last lesson, we looked at equations and we said that whatever we have on the product side, must be equal to what we have on the reactant side. So the same thing can be can be applied here. Now, if we look at this reaction or this equation, as if it was an equation, 
we'll see that we have the two reactants. The two reactants would be the solvent and the coffee powder. The products would be the coffee solution. So whatever mass we have on the reactant side must be equal to the mass of the products. Again, the masses of the reactants must be equal to the mass of the product. Now, this leads us to a term that we call conservation of mass, which states that mass cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. Again, the law of conservation of mass states that mass cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. So whatever you have on the reactant side in terms of mass must be equal to the same amount of mass on the product side. I hope that helped. <clears throat> now, I want you to investigate this at home. But this time, I want you to use a spoon full of salt. All right? I know you guys will not have beakers at home, but you can use a cup. All right? But you need to measure the mass of the cup. Then you add the water to it. Now, to find the mass of the water, right, you need to subtract what? We already know the mass of the cup. So once you've added the water to the cup, you need to subtract the mass of the cup to get the mass of the water. All right? So you're going to add a certain volume of water, which weighs a certain amount of mass, plus you need to weigh your salt. Now, at the end, you should end up with a product which is equal to the mass of the salt and the mass of the water used. Now, this is a little home experiment and investigation that you can do, right? Now, if you have a kitchen scale, you can have a go at this one. So, in my example, I used 50 grams of water, 7 grams of sodium chloride salt, and I ended up with seven, 57 grams of salt solution. Remember, what's, e what's on the left side must be equal to what's on the right side. So you guys can have a go at home. The water and the salt solution are the same color. Why do they have different masses? Now remember, it states that mass cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. Now, not because you cannot see it means that it's not there. It's just that it dissolved. Now, we looked at the definition for the word dissolved before, and you can go back to that. Now, dissolving involves two materials, and the resulting solution is a mixture of both. So, what you're seeing on the product side is a mixture of the salt and water. So the mass will be equal to the amount of salt that you used and the volume of water or mass of water that you used. <clears throat> now look at this. Now, if 10 grams of salt is added to 50 grams of sea water, what is the mass of the solution? Remember, whatever is equal, whatever is on the left side of the equation must be equal to what's on the right side. So if we have 50 grams of seawater and we have 10 grams of salt, what should be the mass of the product? The answer is 60. As you can see, the mass of the solution is equal to the mass of the solute and the mass of the solvent used. So again, mass cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. So any amount of mass that you use on one side of the equation must be equal to the mass of either the reactant or product on the other side of the reaction. How much salt 
will be recovered if the mixture is separated by evaporation? Hmm, that's a very good question. How much salt will be recovered if the mixture is separated by evaporation? Can you guys answer that question? How much salt will be recovered if the mixture is separated by the evaporation? All right. Now, always remember that seawater is a mixture of salts and minerals. Now, you might end up with more salt than that that you added to it. So we added 10 grams of sodium chloride now we might end up with more after we have evaporated the water. So we do not have a fixed volume of salt that we can get. We know that we have to get back our 10 grams of salt that we added, plus whatever other dissolved salt that was already in the seawater mixture. Now, a solid does not disappear when it dissolves to form a solution. What happens to the particles? Now we have a solute plus solvent is equal to a solution. Now this is a very simple equation for you to remember and you must remember this. A solute plus solvent is equal to solution. In a solution, the particles from the solute are no longer closely packed together. They are evenly spread out between the particles of the solvents. Remember I said it with the salt and the sugar. Once they are all together, you'll be able to see them. But once we disperse them into the solution, or the solvents rather, and we mix it thoroughly, the particles become evenly distributed. So you cannot see any one particle, but you just see a mixture of it. Now, these are two words that you guys need to know the difference between. Why is dissolving different from melting? Are they the same? And the answer is no. Dissolving is different from melting. Now, if we go back to the very first, I think fifth and sixth slides, we'll realize that there are differences between them. Now, we can say that dissolving involves two materials or two substances, because one is being dissolved into the other. So if you look at the equation above, two things reacting together. So we add salt, which is the solute, plus the water, which is the solvent. Those are the two things that are coming together. Now, the salt, which is a solute, will be dissolving into the solvents to give us a solution. So it is two materials. Resulting solution is a mixture of both. You get that? And melting. Melting is only one substance. Yes, only one substance is involved in this process. And if you're looking at melting, we're moving from one phase or state to another. So we're moving from a solid phase or state to a liquid state or phase. Now, what we have in the solid state, once it's molten, it has to be the same. For example, ice. Ice is a solid. Once we melt it, we know that we have water. Once we freeze that water, it goes back to being ice but it is still the same thing. Awesome. A solution is a special type of mixture that is made when a solid dissolves and mixes with a liquid. For example, a cup of tea is a solution. The solid that dissolves, example the coffee, is called the solute. The liquid does the dissolving and is called the solvent. 
or many other examples of solutions you can think of. So again, a solution is a special type of mixture that is made when a solid dissolves and mixes with a liquid. Now, if we look at the driving question, what are solutions? You should be able to now answer that question. A solution is a special type of mixture that is made when a solid dissolves and mixes with a liquid. Now we have different types of solutions that we can list. For example, a cup of coffee is a solution. What makes it a solution is one, the solvent, which is a coffee powder or granules that are dissolved in the water or the solvent. Now the question, how many other examples of solutions that you can come up with? See, water is an example. Gasoline is an example. Glass is an example. Steel is an example. And air is an example. Remember, these are all mixtures. Now, I can see little question marks going up above your heads when I mentioned glass. Remember, glass is basically sand heated. It's heated at a particular temperature, which changes the entire dynamics and molecular structure of the sand itself. So sand is made of silica when heated in the presence of oxygen produced silicon dioxide, which is glass. So it is a mixture, all right? Now let's have a go at this. What you must remember. Now, what is made when a solute is added to a solvent? What is it that we get? We get a, it's dissolving, it's dissolving. We get a solution. The solute dissolve in the solvent and forms a solution. Now, if you keep adding sugar to hot tea, does the sugar keeps on dissolving? That's a question. Have you ever tried mixing something out and it will not dissolve? Now, there is a particular reason for that. And that's another S word that we spoke about at the beginning of the lesson. <clears throat> what is happening? There is a limit to the amount of sugar that can be dissolved. When no more sugar can be dissolved, the solution is saturated, right? You can add sugar to a liquid and it will dissolve. Once all the particles are evenly distributed and the solution cannot hold anymore, the sugar granules will start to pile. Get that? And that is when it becomes saturated. You have more solute than solvent. Again, if you keep adding sugar to hot tea, does the sugar keep on dissolving? The answer is no. There is a limit to the amount of sugar that can be dissolved. When no more sugar can be dissolved, the solution is, is considered to be saturated. Now, our last slide. Is mass conserved? Explain. Now, we have a solvent, which is water. And remember, water is a universal solvent. We have other solvents that we use in science, but water is the most common one. So we have a mass of 250 grams. And we add 5 grams of copper sulfate, five grams of copper sulfate. Now we end up, we ended up with what? 265 grams, but we added, what did we add to it? We added 10.5 grams of oil. Is mass conserved? You can answer this question on a piece of paper, take a picture of it and upload it and I'll respond to your work in Google Classrooms. All right, 
So a mass of water, 250 grams. We added five grams of copper sulfate to the solution or the solvent rather. And we added 10.5 grams of oil. And we ended up with 265 grams of copper sulfate solution. Is mass conserved or not? Now we have reached the end of our lesson. And by this point, you should be able to answer the driving question. What our solution? Please go to Google Classroom and complete the Google quiz. Until next time. Be safe.